Hi everyone and welcome to MobyCon's webinar, our virtual study tour, Dissecting the Dutch Street. My name is Melissa Bruntlett. I'm the International Communications Specialist here at MobyCon. And in a moment you'll be seeing Leonard Nout, who's one of our mobility advisors and the manager of international strategy. Uh, so today's webinar is going to walk you through a typical Dutch street, uh, learning a bit about the elements that make it what it is and why we enjoy the cycling numbers we do here. A uh, bit of housekeeping about the format. So today, the reason we've kept the audience small is we're testing out multiple screens uh, to give you a 360 degree view of a Dutch street. So bear with us if there's any technical difficulties and be sure to comment afterwards uh, and let us know how we did, where we can improve to make this even better for next time. Uh, the session will be approximately 30 to 45 minutes plus 15 minutes of questions afterwards with a little break. Uh, like our last webinar, we will be going on to Menti for some uh, questions and uh, sorry for questions and, and uh, moments to provide feedback. So please go to menti.com and wait for the code that will come up in the presentation. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Leonard. Yes, welcome, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, this webinar about dissecting the, the urban uh, Dutch neighborhoods. Um, and I'm Leonard House from Mobicon. Uh, first, I want to talk to you a little bit about what Mobicon does. Uh, maybe some of you know what we do, but we're a, a sustainable mobility consultancy based in the Netherlands, but offices in Canada, in the U.S. and Canada. And we provide cities with everything they need to um, get a high remote share for bikes and walking and public transit uh, and make their cities better um, in general. With our mission is to make the, the world uh, less dependent on cars. So everything we do is trying to reduce car dependency. Um, so now you know a little bit about us, not a lot. Um, the first question on the Menti uh, is, is uh, on the screen, um, and that is what profession do you identify with most? I know a lot of you are like plan engineers or planners or engineers, but um, there, there's a, a whole spectrum of people there. Um, so we'd like to get a little bit of a feel for what type of audience we have today. Um, the code is at the top of the screen. It is 286177, and you can use that to log in uh, to the Mentimeter. And there you'll see the first question that should be open on your screen. Um, it works because one person has already answered it. I know there's a little bit of a delay in the YouTube feed, which means that we'll wait for a couple of seconds for uh, you guys to um, fill out the first question. Um, transport planners are winning. No tra ah, traffic engineer, good. At least one traffic engineer. We've got 10 answers. Uh, I don't know how many people are watching the stream at the moment. Uh, 15, ah, there we go, this is excellent. So some urban designers, transport planners, two traffic engineers, excellent. There will be a little bit in this presentation for all of you. Um, it is a bit of an overview from a planning perspective uh, all the way to like the design details perspective. Uh, we'll go into everything and because we literally have a 360 degree view and a small group, we can make it a little bit interactive, um, which means that if there's anything you want to see or zoom in on uh, or something that you saw passing by during the, the virtual um, study tour, you can actually tell us and we'll go back to that point after the break. Um, so with 29 answers, I think we'll call it for this slide. Um, eight transport planners, which is not surprising. Six other, which is always interesting. Um, advocates, urban designers, uh, two traffic engineers and a policy, three policymakers. Nice mixed audience, I reckon. So the content for today, uh, we're really zooming in from a very high level down to the very detailed level. Uh, first, we'll start with a little bit of geog geographical context to give you an idea of what the, the, the city is that we're talking about. Um, then it's a very uh, interesting neighborhood from a planning perspective. So we'll give you a little bit of background on how that uh, new neighborhood came to be. Um, we'll talk about the network context, like what kind of network for cycling, walking, um, but also for the car. Uh, what does it look like in that new development? Um, and then we'll take our virtual study tour with our 360 degree camera where we'll zoom into specific street level uh, design details, uh, but also urban design uh, detailing. And we'll, you can get a feel for what the neighborhood looks like. Then we'll have a short little break where you can uh, put in your questions um, and we'll answer them after the break, hopefully. <laughs> um, I'll try and stick to my timing, but I can't guarantee anything. So uh, the topic of today is the city of Leiden. Uh, it's a pretty small city for international standards, about 120,000 people, a large university city, very old, 
a noteworthy fact when they sell you a house there is that it has the longest uh, ring of canals outside of Amsterdam. So it's a very, um, they call it a little small Amsterdam. And you can see on the picture, it does have a little bit of that feel, but then on a much smaller scale. Leiden is obviously located in the Netherlands. Um, this is a map of the whole of the Netherlands where you'll see that the uh, city of Amsterdam is, is right there. And Leiden is about 20 minutes by train south of there. Um, right between, south of Schiphol Airport, between The Hague and uh, Amsterdam City. You can see in this image, uh, Leiden has a very notable um, canal ring outside the, the city center. Uh, I hope you can see my arrow. Uh, this little belt of canals is, the, is basically the ring of the, the old city center. Um, and the neighborhood that we're talking about today is right to the north of that central ring. Um, from this image, you can already tell what's new and what's old. Uh, all these streets are part of the new development called New Leiden. Um, New Leiden has, a, or this area has a very long history. It's always good to get a little bit of a feel for what the history is. Um, so this is the map from 1900, uh, where you can see this area where the, in yellow is the, the project area, still underdeveloped, uh, just a paddock and some fields outside of the city, so undefended, so it wouldn't be very uh, interesting to develop it at that stage. Um, but later on, you see a little bit of development sprawling out of the, of the city center uh, ring. Here you can already see that the first buildings are popping up and the first factories are, are starting there. Um, in 1970, you can see this area has become quite built up around it, but within the, the project area itself is still a big uh, industrial uh, site. It used to be the, the municipal slaughterhouses. Uh, you can still see some remnants that we'll find later on in the presentation. Um, and it was just a, a pretty yeah, derelict area, not very attractive to live. A lot of uh, old houses that were well, ready to be torn down, and obviously that factory space that was a very large site, but very close to the city center and very close to the train station, which made it very attractive. Um, you can see between 1970 and 2000, a lot of development to the north of this area, which might be an interesting um, topic of a next uh, webinar or a virtual study tour. Um, but here you can see that the slaughterhouse is really enclosed by the whole city of uh, Leiden, but still uh, fairly underdeveloped with a lot of open space and a lot of houses that were in a bad state of repair. Very unattractive, unappealing area, which is what the city wanted to address when they developed this plan uh, in 2005. And this is what it looks like today on the map. Uh, you can see that the, the factory has disappeared and instead shows a nice uh, grid-like structure um, of streets uh, with uh, horizontal and or north, south, east, west orientation um, and a very different uh, look and feel. So this is what the urban design concept looked like. It's developed by MVDRV, a famous architecture firm uh, from the Netherlands. Um, they wanted to create a very dense, uh, really urban neighborhood, but they also wanted to um, achieve uh, a, a different or cater for a different type of people that would live there. So it was generally considered a very unattractive neighborhood with very low quality of housing stock. Um, and they wanted to make it inviting for, for a different group of uh, people kind of gentrifying it in some sense, but it needed to be in some very constrained, uh, in a very constrained site. So what they decided is that they were gonna go for very high density, um, double the density that you would normally see in a, in a low, low rise buildings, uh, which means 90 square meter lots, so 900 square feet for American context. Uh, very small lots, but with very expensive houses, about half a million euros, um, all self or all of the individual houses were self-built. So each of these were fit in, a, in, a, in an urban design framework, but each of the buildings itself had a separate architect and the person who bought the plot was allowed to design it however way they wanted to uh, within the, the, the footprint that they were given. Uh, there was also a uh, high rise buildings on the, on the edges of the development. You can see that in the top left of this building or of this uh, uh, model. Uh, where they developed some more uh, yeah, towers, maybe five, 10, 10 story towers, uh, and 20% of that was also social housing. So an interesting mix. Um, so from an urban planning perspective, this is really unheard of in the Netherlands where you have such centrally located, um, individually designed houses. So great opportunity for a, a specific type of um, customer or resident. And this is what it looks like on the, on the, on the street level, the dissection of a neighborhood. Um, What's interesting about this is the, the car parking in the middle, half sunk. Uh, I think in the end, it kind of ended up being more or less at ground level, but that was the part that was developed by the corporation that developed the whole 
uh, area. Everything around that was developed by um, individual developers with individual architects. So they together prepared the site and prepared the car parking, um, set aside very narrow streets, eight meter uh, f um, building phase to building phase streets. So that's very uh, narrow, obviously not suitable for cars. Um, and then individual architects could design however way they wanted to. And this is what it looks like, what it looked like when it was just uh, finished or about to be finished. You can see each of the houses has a similar look and feel, but all kind of different uh, in, the, in their design, uh, which is what we'll see on the 360 video later on. Now that's from the planning perspective, a very interesting uh, neighborhood. Why we chose this neighborhood for this webinar is because it's also very interesting from a network perspective and from a design, a street design perspective. Um, so first I want to talk to you very quickly, very briefly, three to five um, characteristics of a good uh, network. Uh, it, and some, some of these elements will come back uh, during the virtual study tour that, uh, later in the presentation. So it's coherence, a coherent network for, for walking and biking, but also for driving. Uh, you want a, a cycling network to be uh, very direct. You want it to be attractive, um, which you have uh, influence on if you plan a whole greenfield or brownfield development. Uh, it obviously needs to be safe uh, and it needs to be comfortable. And that has several aspects, but also the, the type of pavement you use, for example. Um, that network typology that's, that translates in a, in a, in a layout that's kind of similar to this, where you have a few streets that are really focused on flow, um, for cars, that is. Um, so high, higher speed, not um, any uh, property accesses from that street, uh, which then diverge into the, the arterial roads, which are distribution roads that distribute from the flow to the, the actual properties. And then you have the access streets, which are, which are really focused on accessing those um, individual houses, driveways, parking garages, that kind of stuff. Um, and that distinction between these three typologies is very clear in the neighborhood that we're talking about. Now, the way to achieve that safe and inviting um, uh, surroundings without putting in a whole lot of traffic calming or um, without having to put a speed camera on every single street is by using uh, traffic psychology in a positive way. And that means that to make sure that people drive that, that low 30 kilometer per hour speed in those excess streets where you want to have your children being able to cross and play and uh, all those living street elements that you want, you have to keep the speed down. But that means that you can't make people drive for more than about six minutes uh, on a 30 kilometer per hour street before they have to reach a 50 kilometer per hour street. Otherwise, they'll start speeding up and you're really gonna see some safety impacts. Um, and that's been translated very well uh, in the network that we'll see in a minute. I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, then another interesting, pers uh, interesting element uh, in this neighborhood is the relative directness, uh, where you want to make trips by bike or on foot. Well, you want to make them more direct than by car. Not just as direct, but more direct, which means that a car might have to do a little extra detour, uh, spend some more time on the road uh, going around a certain area, um, but a bike or a pedestrian uh, can cut straight through. Um, and that's a very important element, especially with a neighborhood that's fairly close to the city center and close to the train station, uh, where you want to encourage people to use those modes to get to their destination. So if we look at the, at the, the new Leiden neighborhood, uh, this is a map of the car network, where in the dark red, you see the, the main 50 kilometer per hour distribution roads. So they're uh, higher speed, uh, fewer crossings, fewer intersections, uh, more capacity, more focused on getting cars to their destination. Um, in green, or the, the, the brownish green, yeah. um, those are 30 kilometer per hour distribution roads. It's a bit of a light and special, um, not recommended, but it does kind of work. And with all, uh, each of the, the white streets you see in the middle, um, those, those are all access roads, all 30 kilometer per hour, and will not necessarily have um, separated bicycle facilities, for example. So this is the car network. So if you were to drive in from wherever, um, you'd start at the, on one of these streets, then uh, drive down, turn right into the, uh, into the neighborhood, and then turn right again into your car parking garage, for example. Um, and that where you, you, you um, transition from a 50 kilometer per hour environment to a 30 or less environment. And the bike network, on the other hand, is less outside in and more straight through the middle. So this is where you can see the, the directness in action. So for example, um, these, these thick red lines are separated bike facilities uh, straight through the middle of the, of the neighborhood, which means that any trip towards the city center uh, is gonna be faster by bike 
uh, and shorter by bike or by on, on foot than it is going to be by car. No, no um, detours or no having to turn left, left, left out of your um, environment. And that's been really, the, the bike is really in the center of the uh, development, which I think is a really, um, really nice feature of this new build um, development. Because we often hear that, oh, in your narrow streets and your old city centers, you can't, uh, you can't have cars, so that's why people cycle a lot. The streets are just too narrow. Uh, but it's not, this, this shows that it's not just by, um, by accident or by historical context, um, but it also is because we plan that way. And even in the new build facilities or new build um, neighborhoods, we can, we can plan that way and get the outcomes that we want. So, a little bit of context. Now we'll go on our first virtual bike ride. Uh, we have not done one of these before, so I hope everything is going to go well. Um, on the map here, you see our little, uh, the route that I um, cycled with a 360 degree camera. Uh, we'll start at an arterial road, uh, follow then the, the car network into the development. Then we'll transition to the bike network, follow that across, um, cycle down a few of the pedestrianized streets and then end up on that uh, distributor road at the bottom. So there's a few different um, street environments and I'll talk you through those changes. A few instructions. If this was a normal uh, bike tour, I would say follow me, but in this case you have no choice, so don't worry about that. Uh, also don't stop because you can't because I'm in the driver's seat. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know, but use the Mentimeter so we have a, a good overview of all of the questions that arise along the way. They can be very specific. It can be something that's not quite in view that you want to zoom in on uh, because afterwards we're going to be able to scroll through the whole video um, and we're going to be able to zoom into different um, aspects. So don't worry, you can ask as many questions as you want. But if you do have a specific question about a, a specific point in the video at the timestamp, you see in this image that there's a timestamp hopefully in view almost all the time, um, which makes it much easier for us to find back the, 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 the moment that you have a question about. Uh, then a few things to look out for while you're watching uh, this video and, and listening to me. <laughs> Uh, the, the transition points between environments, so that 50 to 30 kilometer environment, for example, but also from a car environment to the bike environment is quite interesting. Uh, what materials are used? Um, so asphalt versus bricks versus tiles, but also the, the materials in the urban design uh, context. There's a few very clever things that they've done um, to make this all space efficient, because as you can imagine, they're very narrow streets, but they made it work anyway. Um, and see if you can spot the five characteristics uh, of the good network design. So with that, I'm going to change over to the bike, uh, to the, the, the 360 camera. And I'm going to do that this way. Magical. So this is the starting point. Um, we are currently on a bridge. It doesn't look like a bridge, but it is a bridge. This is the bridge over the great, the big arterial street that's um, on, was on the map. You can see there's a a tunnel with a four-lane arterial with bus lanes um, going underneath this. Um, they wanted to create a good green crossing because this is the main bike network, so they decided to make it into a little park. Um, don't let anybody tell you you can't plant trees on top of a bridge because you sure can. And uh, from this, we'll ride into the development that is this way. There we go. So far, so good. <laughs> um, I can zoom out. Here's the first little point of interest, uh, an intersection of two very busy, well, not currently busy because thank you, COVID-19, uh, normally very busy bikeways, um, but as you can see, it doesn't have a lot of engineering going on. There's little shark's teeth, and um, they're the, the omnipresent marking that means give way to um, crossing users, um, but that's about it. There's very light separation between bikes and pedestrians, not necessarily a huge fan of it, but this darker asphalt is for um, pedestrians and the lighter is for bikes. I'm going to turn left just to show you a little bit of that arterial street that I was talking about. Here on the right hand side you see the high-rise building which includes a lot of the social housing apartments. Still uh, very nice apartments I think but um, and brand new obviously. And this is where we're going to transition from or if you were to drive a car this is where you would turn right into the into the development. So you can see a car here on the left hand side uh, waiting to turn right. Obviously, the bike will have green first, uh, fully protected phase, um, and I'm going to turn right into this neighborhood. 
So we're currently still on a 50 kilometer per hour speed limit, 30, 35 miles an hour. Um, and you can tell because it's a black asphalt street. Black asphalt streets generally indicate a 50 kilometer per hour speed limit. And here on the right, you see the entryway uh, into the parking for the, for the social housing. Um, on the left hand side, you see a separated bidirectional bikeway um, that feeds into the bike lane across the busy arterial street. You can see here, by the way, this is a little map, the GPS track of where we're gonna cycle. Um, yes, so a little bit of visitor parking on the side. You can see on the right-hand side, the new houses from New Leiden. On the left-hand side, the old, um, the old development from the 70s. Um, and this is where we're gonna transition to a 30 kilometer per hour zone. You see the sign, this means uh, 30, 30 kilometers. There's markings on the ground, but the real transition is here, where you see that we transition from asphalt um, to bricks. And the intersection is raised to a level flush with the footpath, which makes it very easy to cross for people in wheelchairs or with prams, for example, um, and is a re very good clear indicator for um, drivers that this is a give way to the right situation. Uh, no markings, no, no signals, um, even the diagonal crossing, because as you remember on the left-hand side is a bi-directional cycleway. Um, so bikes will have to cross diagonally um, from that side to this side, um, but there's no markings or anything for that. And we can do that because this is a point where the speed's gonna be low. People are gonna make eye contact before they turn, um, so it'll be safe to do so. Then we're gonna turn right. Um, this, is a, this sign means dead end street, um, but bicycles are exempt, which is always a good sign to see when you're riding a bike. And this is then one of the main access streets for cars into the development. You see, um, no, uh, no parking on the, on the street, a very narrow width. This is two way, it'll be about 4.8 meters wide. Um, two way street, no parking, uh, but access to the car parks. And those accesses are here. For example, this one on the right, um, so this is where you see in that uh, cross section that we saw earlier of the development, this is one of those car parking entries. So there'll be, uh, there's two car parks per house, so still quite a high parking, um, um, parking minimum or, yeah, well, minimum and maximum. Um, but it's semi underground. Um, houses that have been developed here have no gardens, they just have a roof terrace on top of the parking garage. And this is where they access that parking garage from. Um, this, um, this ramp here, you'll see more of those later on, is a, a precast concrete um, block, just plotted into place as a one in five angle, so pretty steep, which means that cars will really have to slow before they turn onto the footway. Uh, and the footway is flush to indicate that they have full priority um, and cars are not allowed to take priority over pedestrians. <coughs> then we'll pass a little park on the left-hand side even when, uh, even with, or because of the double density for the low rise houses, they were managed to still put in some open space. Um, quite a nice little park, especially now with lots of kids uh, playing. And this is where we'll cross from the um, car realm, basically, this is still a car street, to a bike only pathway. You see the same blocks are used, um, so just a uh, precast concrete block for a ramp, makes it cheap to build. Um, no bollards, because we think that, or the designers probably thought that the bollard would be more uh, a higher risk than it would, the problem that it would solve, um, which means that cars could physically cross into this bike lane if they really wanted to, but they're not. Not generally, anyway. Um, just missed that tree, it's nice. Uh, this is the, the central canal, so this is the north-south uh, axis for the, in the bike network. Uh, the canal, obviously, for stormwater uh, catchment and retention. Um, and this, um, here on the left, an interesting little feature, a bike pedestrian modal filter trying to keep the bikes out of the pedestrianized streets that are here on the side. We'll, we'll, look, we'll cycle into one um, later on anyway. Don't, don't tell anyone I did that. Um, yeah, so some people park their boats. On the other side is a, is a separated footway. Um, only for pedestrians, and this is where we'll turn into what's actually the real main street of this development, the central east-west uh, corridor. I'll quickly show you on a map where we are for your image. So we're currently in the video 
on this street, um, an east-west corridor that, that cuts across the whole um, development. So this is the real main street where there's access um, to the bike parking, for example, which is in the same area as the car parking, except it has access on the other side. So bikes leave from this side through this door that you can see here. Um, cars leave from the other side into that street that we saw earlier. Another nice little feature is what I think is really um, clever is how they um, suspended the, the, the street lights instead of putting poles in, which would just cut in, into, your, into your space. They suspended them, them from the buildings uh, on wire. And again, on the right-hand side, uh, Car Street from the 1970s development where they meet up. So here they did put some bollards in because I guess at some point you have to cut um, or make, make this really impossible for cars to travel through. Um, don't tempt them. Um, so they did put a bollard in. The placement is not ideal because it lacks any markings or um, um, yeah, it should be better marked so people don't ride into it, but I guess in the sense it's okay. Uh, also, as you can see, not, uh, no physical separation between bikes and pedestrians. Uh, it's the same, it's flush level with a little channel in the middle for stormwater, um, but other than that, flush, but the, the materialization is very different. So it's very clear to all users who's supposed to be where. In general, where are we? 237, there we go, yes. Another thing I really like is, uh, here's another bikeway junction. What I really like about this uh, development as well is that they didn't cut any corners, for example, with this bridge. Um, if they were wanted to save money, they would have put this bridge at a 90 degree angle with the canal, um, but instead they chose to align it uh, perfectly with the, the bikeway access through the middle of the development, and does have, they does have two diagonal bridges um, across, across the development, which is a nice little feature. Um, so there we crossed the pedestrian network. You wouldn't even have noticed, but it was the main pedestrian north-south link. And then here is an, on the right-hand side, another um, car entry street. You can see these people have a parking, but also an internal uh, gar garage. Um, so cars can go into this street, but obviously separated with uh, planter pots to keep them out of the bike way. Again, access to the um, bike parking here on the left with the door, suspended lights above. And now we're gonna turn into one of the pedestrianized side streets. The pedestrianized side streets, they were a uh, nice house on the left. Um, these were all designed uh, together by the, by the local residents. A lot of the maintenance is done by them as well. Um, but they're all, they're all a little bit different. They all have their own little features. Um, and a lot of them will have these picnic tables or benches and to give them a real community feel. And you'll very often see kids playing here. Um, it's a very nice enclosed space. Watch the tree, Leonard, watch the tree. Um, it's really an extension of the, of the, of the houses with, while they have, might not have a garden individually, they still have that space outside to play for children and the parkland, obviously. Now we're on the southern access road to the, the parking again on the, on the right hand side, visitor parking on the left. Um, and here you see some of the old buildings that were uh, retained from when it was a, a slaughterhouse. These were the, the stables where the cattle was brought in. On the right hand side, pedestrian high street, uh, a speed table here to reduce some of the speed for, because there's more visitors on this street than on the other street. Um, but also this speed table doubles as an access to the park um, to provide flush, um, a flush crossing for pedestrians and prams and um, wheelchairs, for example. Then we're gonna keep going. Am I doing for time? No wonder. <laughs> Don't know. Until I hear complaints, I'll just keep going. Um, another speed table. We are at four minutes. Yes. So here we're gonna turn into um, the next pedestrianized street so you can see the comparison with the first one quite a different look and feel again a lovely park on the left with the old uh, director's house um, so you can see a lot of parking on this street but it's all bike parking obviously and um, these people actually in inter um, internalize some of that parking within their own site by creating an overhang and um, still have a cargo bike parked outside 
you can see that all of these little pedestrian streets are very different. Watch the tree. Um, and the houses are very uniquely designed, which makes it a, a very interesting neighborhood with a lot of different textures on, on the, within the urban fabric. Now we're back on the main east-west corridor. And you'll see that the, the level of this neighborhood is a little bit higher than the, the surrounding neighborhood. Um, that's probably because of the soil conditions and maybe some climate change and preparation. And now we're back on the car access road where on the right hand side you have the original development which is um, probably early 1900s or late 1800s. Um, and now we're riding towards that access road on the, the distributor road on the southern side that is the 30 kilometer per hour um, link along the canal or the old defense works of the city are. So these are again some original buildings on the left. Um, on the right hand side you see a school. And this street, while I said earlier that um, every street that has black asphalt is has a 50 kilometer per hour street limit, that is not true in this case. Um, I don't know why, but for some reason the municipality chose to pave this in asphalt, um, yet give it a 30 kilometer per hour speed limit which means that any car coming here from the left will technically have to yield to me on a bike. In practice, that is dubious if that happens. Um, otherwise, it's a very narrow street uh, with an interesting cross-section because on the left, you see it has a curb uh, and a semi-paved path. On the right-hand side, no curb, and these are actually parking bays, um, but without a curb, which doesn't invite for very good parking, but it does mean they're easier to remove later on without touching the curb, which is an interesting, which I hope is what they were aiming for. Uh, and with that, we are at the end of the bike tour. So that was quick, I know, um, but this was the first test. So this is uh, for us to see how this works. I'm glad it all worked fairly well so far. Um, and now it is time for you guys to ask questions. Uh, we will gather questions through the Mentimeter app um, and we'll give you a few minutes to ask your questions. Put them in here. If you have a specific timestamp for your question, please, uh, I hope you've written it down. Otherwise, just a general question is fine as well uh, and we'll cover those and we'll be back in about three minutes.
Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, so we've been collecting questions and obviously resetting <laughs> the stage here for you. Uh, so we're going to walk through them. Leonard's going to tell you what his feedback is for your questions, and uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion. OK, so our first question, uh, all uh, 30 kilometer or less streets are done in pavers, correct? Um, in principle, yes, but in, well, in reality, some cities choose not to. There can be valid reasons for it. For example, uh, vibrations. Um, um, brick, brick streets can have slightly higher vibrations, um, and, and s uh, some houses don't have proper foundations, older ones, um, and then the vibration can cause damage in the, in the houses. That is generally offset by the lower speed you'll get through uh, having a, a street in paver. So in practice, it doesn't really create a lot of extra vibrations, but in specific circumstances, that can be a problem, and then they choose asphalt uh, sometimes. But it's not good for speed because people will think it's a faster road than it is. Fair enough. Our next question is on the tech. So how did you get the... Uh, yeah. The tour done. <laughs> yes, well, that's our secret. <laughs> um, no, we used a Garmin 360 camera. Uh, it's called VIRB. And uh, there was a very high tech solution where I got a broomstick, uh, duct taped it to the back of my bike, and then put the camera right on top. Um, and then I just rode around. <laughs> <laughs> so it was definitely the most high tech camera setup uh, I've ever used. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it works quite well. It is, it is 4K resolution, so I don't know how your um, YouTube settings were, but um, it is quite high res, and it gives you, on a, especially on a sunny day, quite clear uh, images, I think. And if it's successful, we'll try to keep going? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I hope so. There's a lot more streets to film, uh, and I'll use my broomstick <laughs> any sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 1 to 13. 13. The width of the carriageway. Okay. Now, I hope you guys can see my screen. This is um, the main, or one of the two access roads for cars um, done in brick, so 30 kilometer per hour speed limit in this case. Um, I haven't measured this particular one, but the minimum guidance, uh, it, this will be built according to the guidance. The minimum is 4.8 meters. I think they stuck to 4.8, uh, which is 15 feet approximately 15-ish wow. feet, <laughs> two-way. Um, and the maximum is about 5.3 or 5.5 meters, which is about 17 foot. So that's what I expect. I can measure it later. OK, next question. At 144, what is the width of the sidewalk or typical width of sidewalks? At 144, what, 144, yes. The typical width of a sidewalk would be two meters. Um, in this case, one of those bricks uh, will be 25 centimeters. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it will be about two meters here. Um, there's obviously an additional footpath on the other side. Um, we're not the best with pedestrian planning, I must say, in the Netherlands. Um, this is a nice example, and I think this is uh, appropriate width for the, the use it gets, especially because there's another one on the other side. Um, but the Dutch sidewalks can be a little bit on the narrow side or sometimes just disappear, uh, in which case it's perfectly legal to walk on the cycleway, and generally that's fine, uh, except in some busy places like Utrecht or Amsterdam, uh, where the, the cycleway will be too busy to safely walk on, and then you have a problem. But um, about two meters is generally the, the required minimum. Okay. So... We've already answered that question. Good. <laughs> Some of the on-street parking is perp perpendicular to the street. Is this preferred to parallel in terms of safety, or is it purely a spatial solution? So you should be able to see here. We have a, a nice example of both. Um, perpendicular on the left, parallel on the right. From a safety perspective, you would want to have uh, parallel, uh, which is much safer because you can see a lot better um, if somebody's coming up behind you or in front of you, uh, at 90 degrees especially, if you um, go front in, back out, it is very hard to see. Um, so in this case, it'll be a spatial um, consideration, and that's not done for safety because we still have quite stringent parking requirements often in these type of developments. Okay. So how are conflicts between people with disabilities, pedestrians, and cyclists addressed in the Netherlands? Uh. where <laughs> there 
are flush services. So in the UK, dogs are trained mm -hmm. to recognize curb, length, curb heights and, yeah. and what have you. Uh, I'm not a guide dog trainer, but I do know that uh, in the Netherlands they'll be they'll be they won't be just trained on curb height. They will be trained on curb height or curb recognition, but there's other cues obviously that they will take. I think the the materials come in into play here, um, but also the speed of a bicycle in the Netherlands is generally not very fast, which means that there's much more time to um, to interact. And if, if you see somebody who clearly um, walking in the in the cycleway with a dog or with a stick that's you know that's not considered a safety hazard because you just go around them and then it's all it's all fine so it's it's maybe less of a problem because the the, the infrastructure itself and the way people use it is more forgiving than in other uh, in the UK for example where you might have more of a safety issue um, but especially in, in environments like this uh, the, the bike pedestrian conflict doesn't really um, exist and I've often seen walking around, at least here in Delft, that there will be um, various treatments, even in a flush, so um, yeah. metal yeah. indicators that you are right. changing. Yeah, yeah, especially areas. in the busier mm -hmm. in the busier areas, there will be um, tactile papers that guide you along around train stations and bus stops. That's that's gener generally well used. Yeah. Okay, how many people live many in people this development? It is probably. Around a thousand, I would say. It's 90 square meters per lot, and it is about 200 houses, individual houses, a uh, bunch of apartments, 140 apartments. Yeah, 1,000, 1,500. Okay. Uh, probably. <clears throat> so at 113, how do you regulate cars which could park on the sidewalk? So in France, the question is coming from France. We need France. physical obstacles to <coughs> avoid these behaviors. Yes. Um, so the, on the screen, you can see the um, the particular street. That's uh, the the access way. Um, so in this instance, there's really no um, nothing stopping you from parking on the sidewalk. Um, it is very much possible. It will it well, might sometimes happen, but there's obviously a downside to putting in a lot of bollards because it takes away space from pedestrians. Um, and as you saw in the video, there's a lot of visitor parking around the development. So there's not really a need to park on the sidewalk in this, uh, in this instance. Uh, residents have two car parks per um, house, so that's plenty of parking. So they don't re really need to park there. They can park securely and safely and free for free inside their own um, parking structure. Uh, visitors, much easier to park on the edge because there's plenty of parking there. Okay. At a minute 30 or 1.30, uh, is on-street parking restricted? So this is the same yes. area, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so there's no parking there. No. Okay. After the speed table, how do car drivers behave? Do they restart uh, fast, generating noise, and higher pollution, or do they keep quiet? Um, well, car drivers are a very... Um, Colorful bunch. <laughs> <laughs> some of them, uh, some of them do drive like crazy. I really don't think Dutch car drivers are any better than uh, car drivers from other places. They just deal with a different environment, so they're more used to seeing bikes. They're probably they probably own a bike themselves. They probably ride a bike uh, a lot, so they're a little bit more aware of bicycles. But that doesn't stop them from doing stupid stuff. Um, so some of them do really go over the speed table and just race off to the next one. That just means you either need more speed tables um, or you need to do something else like stop the traffic. Um, the, the pavement type does matter though because on the, 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 the brick streets it is just not as much fun to drive fast because it just gets very noisy readily. Um, on asphalt it's much easier so that, that really helps. Um, plus the width I think helps. If you have a narrow street, if you have somebody coming from the other side, there is a risk of you scratching your car. And that's the last thing people want to do is scratch their car. So there's, if, if you're just overtaking a cyclist, then there might be enough space. But if there's another car coming, people are like, ooh, that might get dangerous. So if you make it narrow so it just fits, then people will slow down because they want to protect the car. Mm -hmm. uh, because pavement should indicate speed limits, are speed limit signs sometimes not used? Uh, due to proper paving? Uh, no, speed limit signs are 
mandatory, they have to be there, but they can be for a zone. So for example, for the 30 kilometer, you'll see a 30 kilometer per hour zone, and then it's 30 kilometers until there is a zone end sign, um, but they are a mandatory uh, requirement. You can't have a street without a speed limit sign. Yeah. Two general questions. Do you have a rough cost of the housing in this <laughs> area? <laughs> um, and are there many trails <laughs> for traffic engineers in Leiden? <laughs> uh, yes and yes. <laughs> the city desperately needs help. Uh, <laughs> we could also do a whole virtual study tour on badly designed intersections. In perspective, so it's a Dutch badly designed intersection. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a disaster, but it could be better. Um, and I believe there's actually a vacancy currently at the city. So yeah, get in there. How's your Dutch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be important. Uh, houses now go for around 650,000 euros, um, which is uh, about um, $800,000 US yeah. probably. Mm -hmm. um, but they're huge houses for Dutch standards, a whopping 250 square meters maximum. So about 220, 250, including two car parks. Though, so yeah. yeah, it's quite substantial for it's most Dutch. Yes, they're centers. about <laughs> triple the average Dutch house. Okay, what are the rules around passing vehicles passing cyclists on the shared streets? Uh, you have to do so safely. There's no minimum distance required. You don't have a three feet passing law or anything like that. But yeah. But then the benefit often with shared streets that the speed is already lower, yeah. so yeah. people are already being more careful. Yeah. Because okay. the bike also scratches your car. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> The use of pavers and similar materials not only provides sensory clue, clue, ugh, clues, uh, but also obviates the need for heavy equipment and weight. It's more of a comment. <laughs> Waste mm -hmm. during maintenance. Yes, yeah. correct. Um, if you want to put in, uh, well, I once was in New York, and I think they were trying to install an internet cable or something, and it took about five guys, three with jackhammers, and they were drilling into the concrete pavement for hours just to put in or fix a cable underneath. In the Netherlands, it'd be one guy with a shovel. He can literally dig up uh, the pavement uh, for however long he wants, dig a hole, fix the cable, put the same pavers back in, done in a day. So it is very fast. Um, it's basically like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> it's <laughs> literally putting the jigsaw back together. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've noticed in our neighborhood, even people will come out to help neighbors who want the street to look good. <laughs> we'll <laughs> oh, change the nice. stones around. <laughs> nice. Okay, tell us about New Leiden, uh, the development in terms of structure and ownership, and did mini the municipality own the entire land or sub out some of it? Um, and yeah. is the twenty percent sorry is the twenty percent social housing unique or required? Yeah. Um, so the city owned the land. Um, the city then put the land into a, basically a trust or a development company, land development company, together with the, um, the housing developer, which was a social housing developer. Um, but they, um, they were basically the project developer and this was their, I think it was the first time that they did a scheme like this as well. So it was 50% municipality, 50% the project developer put in together. Uh, they got to develop or make the urban design concept the master plan um, and then the, the housing developer built and maintains still the social housing um, and the rest got sold off for profit to the municipality. Uh, the 20 percent is definitely not unique, it's actually quite low um, for a central or an urban development like this. Um, in Amsterdam it's often 40 or 60 percent even um, depending on who's developing the land. But yeah, 20 percent definitely on the low, low side of the Okay. What about exit construction? So access to the 30k roads and with those for those with visu visual disabilities. So locally driveway aprons are constructed to cover the entire driveway surface. So is this an issue for safety? Uh, don't know if I understand the question. Uh, is it about oh where the, because the, the so there's no indicator for if you're walking across the the, the pavement is flush for pedestrians without any indication that cars might be crossing. I think that's the question. Uh, this is done on purpose because the driver has to give way to the pedestrian. If you would cut into it or make an apron that is too wide, you'll one, get uh, cars going faster, um, and two, you'll make it confusing about who has right of way. There's really no question in this design who has right of way. 
um, you're entering a pedestrian realm. It looks like that uh, pedestrian you're going, it's just a footpath. You feel a little bit awkward as a driver. Plus you have to go very, very slowly because of the steep uh, ramp on the curb blocks. Um, cars are very capable of mounting curbs. We all know that. So don't be afraid to make it uncomfortable for them. Uh, if, uh, internationally, you see a lot of the very shallow uh, aprons or the very long ramps. And I just wonder like, what, why, why is this? <laughs> Cars cannot mount a, a little 10 centimeter apron. They sure can because they do it all the time. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Sorry, having a little you bit click. of trouble with the clicker. Don't do it. <laughs> oh. Okay, there. Oh. No. This is oh, there we go. So how often do pavers need to be replaced? Um, in our jurisdiction, they start to spall and fail after only one to two years. Well, I see a business opportunity. Um, I think Dutch pavers last about 30 or 50 years. If they start to wear on the top, you just flip them over and use the bottom. <laughs> um, no, they, they can last for a long time. Um, we also have freezing conditions, and even within freezing conditions, they last for a long time. So um, they're, they're baked clay bricks. So if you can send us an email, we'll put you in touch with some Dutch producers <laughs> of <laughs> bricks and they can sort you out. And I wonder if this is a scenario where the they're put in pavers, but it's not necessarily a traffic calmed street. Right. High speed, uh, high impact, lots of heavy vehicles. Maybe then your paved street is too wide. Yeah. <laughs> narrow is <laughs> crucial. If it's not narrow, it doesn't work. Okay. How is snow cleared? Snow? <laughs> what's, what's that? <laughs> oh, yeah, we used to have snow. Um, um, yeah, including so the pedestrianized streets and where there are bollards. Yeah. Uh, in the pedestrianized streets, it is, I'm not entirely sure. It will, might probably might be done by the residents themselves. I wouldn't surprise me, but I don't quote me on that. Uh, the cycle infrastructure is cleared with uh, street sweepers. Uh, we don't have snow plows because we, well, we do have them, but we don't use them that much because we don't have that much snow. Um, we use street sweepers and brushes to uh, clean the, the cycle infrastructure, usually before we clean the car infrastructure, uh, especially on an important link like this north-south link through the development. Um, yeah, uh, the bollards, um, they have a little, uh, or municipal workers have a key and they just drop the bollard into the ground, go over and then they raise it again. So it's a very low tech solution. Okay, what do you think the one main reason is that you don't have a mandated passing distance for going around cyclists? It's <laughs> a loaded question. I feel like it's a loaded question. Um, yeah, what leads to the, what happens in other countries? Well, yeah, I think if you have a high, uh, a lack of cycling facilities and high speed, I think you start to come into, well, you might need a rule like this um, because speeds are generally low. Um, in the Netherlands, well, especially on these type of streets where you would encounter cyclists, I don't think you're, we need a passing law like that. And to be honest, if I ride from my, I did it once, it is 28 kilometers from my house to my office. Um, I got passed by like seven cars, I think, on a 28 kilometer ride. Um, if you have separated bike infrastructure, you don't really need a passing law. Um, and if the speed is low enough, then people can pass quite closely. Um, so yeah, if your street is that wide that you can have a one and a half meter passing law, then your street is too wide. So <laughs> Narrowness is everything. Uh, just a quick note, we know that there are questions in the YouTube chat as well, and we will get those to Leonard afterwards because we've still got a number to go through here. And we don't want to keep you all day or night, depending on where you are. <laughs> Uh, accessibility. In the UK, we often specify smooth surfaces rather than pavers. What are your thoughts? Pavers can be very smooth. Well-laid pavers are extremely smooth. Um, in some of my other presentations, I use a slide with two types of pavers. Uh, a properly baked paver has a very straight edge uh, without a, like a 90 degree edge. If you lay those close to each other while a proper professional, it is very, very smooth and you on a bike, you wouldn't even notice a difference with, uh, with asphalt. Um, for cars, we often use the, the less or the more rounded cornered bricks. This gets a little bit technical, I'm sorry. Um, they do slow down cars because they do generate noise and vibrations, and that's something you don't want to use for your pedestrian infrastructure. Um, but I feel like 
the average Dutch cycleway is pretty well paved if it's used in bricks, but asphalt's nicer, but pavers are very useful in that sense, especially for cars. Yeah, well, and in this case, when we're thinking about people in um, assistive mobility devices, yes. yeah, they're obviously more likely to be in either a cycleway or on the sidewalk yes. where the pavers would be smoother. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. There is, I'm not saying there's no issues in Amsterdam, on Dam Square, for example, uh, that is a horrific place to be on any wheels. Um, so I'm not saying that we've got it all sorted, but pavers in general, you can make them as smooth as you want. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, all right. 22. At 422, they mm. noticed that you switched to the sidewalk. That was illegal. <laughs> uh, what does the legislation and practice in the Netherlands say about cyclists' use of pedestrian space? It is illegal, no question. Um, my cousin got a fine for riding on the bike on the footpath because he wanted to ask a police officer a question about <laughs> where he was going, but that was quite <laughs> ironic. Um, so yes, it is, it is illegal. You will get a ticket if you get, well, you might get a ticket if you get a very grumpy policeman on a bad day, um, but unless you're causing any physical harm, uh, you'll probably get away with it. I think the age limit is 12, so kids are allowed on the yeah, on I don't know if we're 13, but... No, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But I did break the law on video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what width was the what was the approximate width of the one five ramp for the cyclist at the one minute thirty one second mark? Uh, the I think we've seen a few of them. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, that'll be a thirty centimeter ramp. Maybe this one's bigger. I think it's 30. I'll, I'll go and measure it. Um, it's generally, oh no, 50, sorry, 50. Yes, because the 10 centimeters, no, am I doing this calculation wrong? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> 10, centi 10 centimeter high curb, one in five, was a 20 centimeter raise, plus a few centimeters, yes, yeah, so that would be 30 centimeter uh, brick. There is a, I can put in the um, YouTube link, a whole collection of these types where you can buy them prefab and get them sent to your house. <laughs> if you want. Uh, interested in Mobicon Center, seminar like this geared towards cities with harsh winters. Uh, what if, how do you cool. questions? Send us an email. Um, we have uh, Angela, who is a member of the Winter Cycling Congress, the board. Mm -hmm. um, so she might be interested in organizing something like this. Very good. Emergency services, do they ever advocate for wider roads so their vehicles can fit and drive faster? And how do you push back on that? Uh, yes, they do. Well, not wider roads. Um, they do know that only a small percentage of the call outs is actually for fires or for, uh, a lot of them are for traffic uh, crashes, also in the Netherlands. Um, they do have a network of um, roads that they maintain as key fire routes, for example. Um, so they, you'll, you'll struggle to put in any uh, vertical, um, any, yeah, any, anything that slows down traffic or um, fire trucks, you'll, you'll get a lot of pushback. But they have a specific network because they'll lay out that network so they have a specific time that they need to meet. They have a seven minute or eight minute um, response time that they need to meet. And if you're gonna seriously impact that travel time, you will get in trouble like anywhere else. But I think the Dutch, emergency services are a little bit more progressive in that sense that they also see how that does make it safer so the net public health benefit is better if you don't have 20 foot lanes. <laughs> okay, uh, was more signage required when the shift to cycling started and now the design language is pretty well established? I was a minus 15 <laughs> when this started, so I don't know how many signs we had. I wouldn't be surprised if there was. <laughs> okay. We might have to go back to the history books for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, density we talked about. In terms of mode share, do we know? Offhand? No, wouldn't be able to tell you the exact mode share. Um, there's a lot of cars, obviously. Um, there's also a lot of bikes, so no, I can't tell. On okay. average, it's 27% bike mode share in the Netherlands, in the cities up to 50, 60. I expect it should be around 50, 60 based on location, but uh, we don't gather mode share data on that fine-grained level, unfortunately. Okay. What 
elevation or rise do you use for raised crosswalks? Uh, to curb level, or whatever your curb is. Here, generally 10 centimeters, but if it's 15, make it 15. Okay, I think is that our final question? Oh, we have YouTube questions. Oh, we don't do YouTube questions. We'll do the YouTube. Ah! ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would recycling and trash collection work? I did not plant this question, but I am very excited that this question came because it was the one thing that I skipped in the video. If we can go back to the video, uh, I will show you. It is... Is it the similar model to most Dutch cities? It is. Um, so obviously there's no bins in the street and no giant bins, um, but we have centralized rubbish collection. I hope this is a question by somebody who knew that <laughs> this was gonna happen um, because what you see here on the video on the, on the, right, the left-hand side is two underground rubbish containers. So they'll be um, opened by cart um, and there you can dump your uh, rubbish bags in it they have a sensor in it that tells the, the, the control center or the, the municipality when it's full. Uh, as soon as it's full, a truck pulls up, uh, lifts out this whole thing, which is like three cubic meters of rubbish, uh, dumps it into the truck through the top, just one guy with a remote control, and puts it back. The whole thing takes two minutes. I timed this because I find this fascinating. <laughs> I'm so excited about the rubbish question. Um, I have one close to my house, and every time I, it comes around, I tried to film it, but I never got him properly. Uh, it's about two minutes and then the whole thing is collected. So it's 24 seven rubbish collection whenever you want. Um, and I just can't imagine that we had a world where you had to be awake at six on a Tuesday to, to take your rubbish bag outside. <laughs> because that just seems, and I have all the rubbish sitting on the street now. Very civilized, very efficient because the rubbish truck doesn't have to come around every week. It just can come whenever needed, which I think is amazing. And it's the same system for ver in various jurisdictions, the same system for recycling as well. So here yep. in Delft, we have the same thing for our containers, for paper, for glass, um, yep. all underground, tucked Tidy. away. <laughs> Something satisfying about the glass breaking oh, when you drop satisfying. it in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, so we do have two more questions. I'm going to call it just because yes. I think Leonard and I are getting hungry. <laughs> it is dinner past dinner time for us. Time. Okay. Will you tell people watching that the Dutch reach is not a real thing and <laughs> quit talking about Dutch it? Dutch reach is not a real thing. <laughs> Stop talking about it. No, it's a great thing, but it's not Dutch. Dutch drivers, instructors don't know what this is. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Oh, oh that Thank is a you. fantastic. I'm glad we went through these questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, like I said, we'll get to the YouTube questions, or I will send them to Leonard to answer with all his technical knowledge. Um, and then, uh, yeah, stay tuned for our next webinar, which will actually be hosted oh, we have by a, myself. We have a question about the, oh. if they want to pay for it. Oh, yes, we did have one more question. Sorry, before you all log off. Leonard's just switching to it now. So we really do... Uh, ah, we have answers already. We have answers. We love Excellent. doing these. It's a lot of fun, and it's a great way to stay connected with you guys while we are limited in our travel abilities. Um, However, we were curious if you'd be willing to pay for said services. So, yes, uh, if yeah. you can take a second to answer, be honest of what. Zero is also a perfectly yeah. legitimate answer. That is no problem. Um, but given that we want to do more of these and we can tailor them to a specific topic. Uh, so, for example, if you're very interested in bus infrastructure, we can go and find some. There's not a lot of it, so maybe not a good example. <laughs> uh, arterial streets, for example, or more of the, the, the detailed stuff. Um, we can do that to a very specific, or winter cycling, very specific audience, so we can organize that. Um, and just for us, we're interesting to see if that's, uh, if that's something we should keep doing, especially now mm -hmm. that travel is probably yeah. out the window for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, yes. Great. Okay, so yes, uh, stay tuned. Two oh, more things. Two more things. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. Uh, we still have the Moby Coach program running, if you have, if you think that we are interesting and we can answer a lot of your <laughs> questions and you have a lot of random questions. Uh, with Moby Coach, you can um, um, ask us to basically give you a, a bit of a subscription plan and you can have several phone calls a month where you just ask random questions to us and we'll do as, mu as, as much as we can to answer those as quickly as possible, um, which can be very useful if you have random questions. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the next MobyCon webinar, because we have a series now, um, presented by Melissa Brundlett, 
um, the webinar series, the next one is the Changing Hearts and Minds, How to Successfully Market Your Cycling Projects, uh, which is a super important topic and a lot of the times this goes wrong. Um, so if you want to know all about that, how to, if you have a project, how to make sure that it gets delivered properly and how to market it, um, join us next time on Thursday the 28th, that is in two weeks. In two weeks. Thursday in two weeks, same time, six European time, 12 New York time, 9 a.m. California, California time. time. Yeah, uh, I and don't know PSD. as a reminder for anyone who's watching, if you're not already on the mailing list, that is the first come place to register for these webinars. Um, most of you probably, well, yes. you already registered because <laughs> it didn't because go out. Yes. <laughs> so just tell your friends if they're interested to yes. register for our newsletter to make sure that they get first dibs on these places. And that's it. That's everything. Thanks for joining. Sorry we went over by 12 minutes, but I hope it was interesting. Um, yeah, and if there's any questions, send us an email or a tweet and we'll get back to you when we can. Yeah. So Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much.